Okay, maybe I will just uh, proceed. So, we were talking about normal extensions. So, a normal extension was a, a, an algebraic extension such that every irreducible, so to just recall, so that means a normal extension This is uh, an algebraic extension uh, such that uh, every irreducible polynomial, so if I call this L over K, such that every irreducible polynomial uh, F with coefficients in the smaller field which has a zero in the bigger field uh, splits into uh, linear factors over L, splits over L. This is somewhat strange definition. If or it doesn't look very likely to happen, but we had this theorem that said that um, so the extension, a finite extension L over K is normal uh, if and only if L is the splitting field of a polynomial with coefficients in K if and only if L is a splitting field of a polynomial in Kx. Okay. So in some sense, it says a strange thing. So if there's one polynomial in Kx, which uh, of which this is the splitting field, so which splits, then um, all polynomials uh, which are irreducible in Kx and have a zero in L will already split, and also the converse. So we had um, <coughs> started the proof. So the obviously it's kind of clear that the difficult direction is uh, this one. And this we had already shown. And it was a somewhat tricky proof. And now the other direction is uh, quite simple. It's kind of the trivial direction. So, so we, <coughs> we take a finite normal extension. So we have to show that L is a splitting field of some polynomial. So we can write uh, L equal to the K adjoint some elements A1 to AL. We know that the finite algebraic extensions are the finitely generated algebraic extensions. So there are finitely many uh, elements AI in L such that L can be written like this. So where the AI in L are algebraic over K. So let Fi be the minimal polynomial of uh, this element AI over K, then this minimal polynomial has uh, obviously 
is zero in L, namely the AI. And so it splits because this is a normal extension. So Fi has a zero, namely AI in L. Thus, AI, uh, Fi splits over L into linear factors. And now we put F to be the product of the Fi. No FL. So then obviously it splits. And, um, um, and obviously, and clearly, uh, k a1 to a n is the, the splitting field or a splitting field of f over k because you know, the polynomial splits over it, and it is obtained from k by adjoining some of the roots of this polynomial. We had seen that if we have a field over which this thing splits, and it's just obtained by adding some of the roots, then it's a splitting field. Our roots are zeros of f. Okay, and so we have, uh, in this kind of stupid way, <coughs> we have obtained that L uh, is indeed uh, the splitting field of a polynomial. We just take any set of elements which generate the field extension and we take the product of their minimal polynomials. Okay. So, <coughs> That was that. Now um, I want to very briefly introduce the characteristic of a field. So, um, so this for the moment is all I say about normal extensions. Now I talk about the characteristic of a field. It's just this thing that uh, if you have an element, so if uh, you have an element n in z bigger than zero, bigger than zero, and uh, we have k field, then we can, you know, we have written n times one. So one is the element one in the field to be. 1 plus plus 1 n times. Okay, so we, uh, we had introduced this for any ring, this notation. Uh, I mean, and for any element A. So maybe. So <coughs> now it can happen sometimes we would have, for some fields, we have n times 1 is equal to zero in K for some n, uh, a positive integer. For instance, we have seen, so uh, if um, P is a prime, a prime number in the integers, then we had seen that we had the set Zp, which as a field we also call Fp. So these are just uh, the numbers modulo p. So as elements, these are elements uh, 
0, 1 to p minus 1, and you add them by adding them and taking the rest. So we had seen that this is a field. And uh, if we take n times 1, so p times 1, this is uh, uh, what we had denoted like this. So the, we take p and take the rest of division of p by p which is equal to 0. So if you add 1 p times, we get 0 in this field. So uh, we see that in this case, um, there is some such number. On the other hand, obviously in the rational numbers, we have n times 1 is never equal to 0 for n bigger than 0. Okay, so we want to uh, give a name to this phenomenon. So, <clears throat> so the smallest number, the smallest positive integer for which n times 1 is equal to 0 in the field is called the characteristic of the field. And we say the characteristic is 0 if there is no such number. So, definition. Let k be a field. So, the characteristic of k is the smallest positive integer. A positive integer with uh, n times 1, which means uh, 1 plus plus 1 is equal to 0, if such an n exists. Otherwise, uh, it is equal to 0. It is defined to be 0. And we denote the characteristic uh, by uh, characteristic of k. So we have just seen that the characteristic of the rational numbers is equal to 0. This will also be true, for instance, for the real numbers. And the characteristic of the finite field Fp, well, it's kind of, it's easy to see that this will be equal to P. Now, obviously, for no smaller number, positive integer than p, we will get 0. All the other ones are different. So now we want to make a few remarks about this. Mark. First, the characteristic of a field is either zero or a prime number. So the characteristic of k is zero or a prime number. And the second one, which is even easier, is that if uh, L over K is a field extension. Then the characteristic of L is equal to the characteristic of K. So it's um, 
invariant undertaking field exception. So this is quite simple. So um, we take I to be the set of all integers such that um, n times 1 is equal to 0 in k. So if I add 1 n times in k, I get 0. So this is an ideal. It's easy to see. So i is an ideal in z. Now if we add two of these, uh, we or take the difference, uh, it would still be the same by the distributive law. You could still get zero. And if you multiply by an integer, uh, if this product was zero and you multiply an integer, it will still be zero. So it's an ideal. Um, and note, it's easy to check that by the distributive law, Uh, we have, if we take n times 1 multiplied, so this is, this means n, you know, n times 1 means you add 1 to itself n times. This is here the multiplication in k. Here, m times 1. And this will it's easy to check that this is the same as you take the product in Z and add one times. It's an easy exercise. Follows from the distributive law. Okay? You can check this, that this will hold, but just by this standard properties of uh, multiplication and addition. So, thus it follows. So thus, if n times m times 1 is equal to 0 in k, then it means that this product is equal to 0 in k. And here we're in a field. So the product of two elements in the field can only be 0 if one of them is equal to 0. So then it follows that n times 1 is equal to 0 or m times 1 is equal to 0. So that means, therefore, that this ideal i is a prime ideal. So thus, i in z is a prime ideal. And it's uh, easy to see that we know all the prime ideals in the integers. So you know, the integers are principal ideal domain. So every ideal is generated by one element. If this element is plus minus a prime number, or then uh, we get a, a prime ideal. And also if, we have, if the element is 0. So, is a, and if, if the element is not a prime number, so it's a product of two primes, we don't get a prime ideal. So, is a prime ideal. So, and this, so we know that, uh, therefore, I is equal to the zero ideal, or I is equal to the ideal generated by p, where p is a prime number. So let me repeat it again, how I explained it. So uh, z is a principal ideal domain. So every ideal is the ideal generated by one number. And we can take uh, this number to be non-negative, because an element, and a number, and minus the number generate the same ideal. So if the 
if this is a number which is a product of, I mean, which is not a prime number, a positive number which is not a prime number, so n times m, you can see that, uh, you know, by formula like this, you find that uh, the ideal is not a prime ideal. So, <clears throat> however, if the, so therefore, the only thing that rests is that the number is zero or a prime number, and then it is obviously prime ideal. So, it means that we have uh, this. And so, and this precisely says, so in this case, the characteristic is zero. In this case, the characteristic is P. So you can also see that there's some justification for saying characteristic zero because it really means the, this ideal is generated by zero. And here the ideal is generated by P. So in the number zero also comes here, whereas in the original definition it is if there's no number, but uh, in this case the number is zero. <coughs> and the second statement is trivial. So what do we have here? If we have a field extension, the element one in L is the same as the element one in K. So one element L is the same element as one element k. So therefore, if you add it n times, you stay in k. So therefore, thus n times 1 is the same element in L and k. So the condition that this element is 0 is the same whether you're in L or in k because it's the same element you're talking about. You know, after all, k is a subset of L. Okay, so I had, um, <clears throat> we had talked uh, the last time a little bit this time about normal extensions. I'd said that uh, there are two crucial properties uh, that we want field extensions to have in order to be somehow nice. Namely, they should be normal and separable. And if they are normal and separable, we call them uh, Galois extensions. And these are the field extensions we want to study. And so I have introduced what normal extensions are, and so now I have to introduce what separable extensions are. Again, it comes with a somewhat crazy definition like the normal extensions did. But in this case, the situation is in some sense even better. Under reasonable assumptions, all field extensions are separable, so that you don't even have to worry about anything at all, at least in characteristic zero. So let's see. Separable extensions. So separable extensions, the condition has to do with multiple roots. So if you have a polynomial f in kx, it will split over some extension field. And uh, you know, it will have you know, a number of zeros. It can happen that some of these zeros coincide. So if you write it as a product of linear factors, then there is a you know, x minus a1 times x minus a2 and so on, x minus a n, it might be that uh, a1 is equal to a2. So it's x minus a1 squared plus and so on. So in some sense, the zero a1 occurs twice. And so we will see that when this happens for our field extensions, for polynomials which were irreducible uh, before, and then we extend it and they get multiple roots uh, that this causes problems and we don't want these problems to be there and so we will exclude it by definition. So, um, so we want to uh, exclude certain ways how multiple roots can occur uh, and uh, for this we make the definition of a separable extension. So let me make the definition. So first I have to want to define again what a multiple root is. So let f be a polynomial with coefficient in some field k, and l an extension of k over which f splits. Um, we have f is equal to, say, b times 
x minus a1 times x minus a n. So then the, um, but I can, um, so I can write here m1 to m n. So we can write it as a product of linear factors, they might repeat themselves. Okay? So where the m i are some positive integers and um, the a i are some elements of L. So then, the, as we know, the a i are the zeros of f, but we also call them the roots of f. And um, an element, so if the number m1 is equal to 1, we call a, so if m i, if this power here is equal to 1, we call a, a i be uh, a simple root. And um, uh, if uh, it is bigger, then we call it a multiple root of order this number m i. So of order m i. Okay, so this is um, the definition. Um, and now we want to see what the separable extension is in terms of these <coughs> multiple roots. The definition looks formally somewhat similar to how we did for the normal extensions. So definition an algebraic field extension Um, again, L over K is called separable if the following holds. If every irreducible polynomial again with coefficients in the smaller field which has a zero in L does not have multiple roots and in fact does not have multiple roots anywhere that means it doesn't have multiple roots in its splitting field. can be you know, written as a product like this where the powers are all one if you uh, make the field big enough so that all the zeros exist. So this is the definition. As you see, it's a not very, <clears throat> it's a bit involved. Um, but anyway, so the, the statement is that um, if we have an irreduced polynomial which has a zero in this field, then it uh, does not anywhere have multiple roots. So in order to make, so, and then just to complete it, uh, so if the field K is such that every algebraic field extension of it is separable, we call the field perfect. Every so if uh, for given k all algebraic field extensions uh, 
are separable. Um, K is called phi perfect. Okay. So now this is a somewhat, uh, so we have this, the definition is in terms of these multiple roots. So in order to do anything with this, we have to have a criterion for the existence of multiple roots. We have to weigh we have to have a way to check whether a polynomial has multiple roots somewhere or not. And this is something that I expect you know about from calculus or high school or whatever, that a polynomial has a multiple root. So A is a multiple zero of a, of a polynomial if it's a zero of the polynomial and of the derivative. So you can easily just check uh, by... Uh, and uh, so the same we can do here, where we define the derivative in the formal way by just using the formula from calculus. Okay, so, so we, where is this? So we have a criterion. for multiple roots. Which will be in terms of the derivative. So let me formally define the derivative of polynomial. So obviously not by calculus, but uh, by just formally writing the formula. We are in any field, not in the real numbers. So definition. So let uh, f be a polynomial, so I can write it as sum i equals zero to n a i x to the i be a polynomial with coefficients in k. So the derivative um, of f is defined by the formula that one would prove in calculus if this was a polynomial with real coefficients is f prime, well, everybody knows what one gets, sum i equal one to n i times a i times x to the i minus one. No, that's what you learn. <coughs> so, and this is obviously also a polynomial. So this is just our definition. And uh, it's easy to check as an exercise that the rules that one knows for the derivative for functions also hold here for these polynomials just by doing the computation. Namely, so if um, A, B are some elements in K and um, F and G are polynomials, then I have that uh, uh, I take a f plus b g and take its derivative. This is a f prime plus b g prime. I mean, I expect everybody of you can prove that from this formula. And also, maybe I should also say if a is a constant, then the derivative is zero. This is uh, even more obvious if you look at the formula. Um, <coughs> and uh, we also have the uh, how's it called? The Leibniz rule, which one has to prove somehow by, well, maybe by induction or something. I mean, anyway, it's an easy exercise. So if I take f times g prime, this is f times g prime plus f prime times g. I think everybody of you would be able to use this definition to prove these statements quite easily. So now we want to uh, also prove this criterion that one has in calculus that a, a multiple root uh, you have when it's a zero of f and of and of f prime. So lemma. So let f 
in polynomial in Kx, a non-constant polynomial, and that L over K be a splitting field of K. Actually, any field over which it splits, anyway, field of K. Um, then A in L is a multiple root of F if and only if f of a is equal to 0 and f prime of a is equal to 0. So <clears throat> obviously in order to be a root, we have, must have that f of a is equal to 0. So let's just see. Um, let r be the order of the root a. So r could also be 0, but anyway. So then we know that f. Then we can write f equal to x minus a to the r times g, where g is a polynomial in L of x, uh, which does not vanish at a. No, that's how you, you know, how you find it. No, if it has a z if if g would be zero at a, you can it is divisible by x minus a one more power. So the the order is precise obtained in such a way. Uh, f can be written as x minus a to the r times g with g of a is different from 0. And now let's take the derivative of this equation. So then, if I take f prime, this is equal by this Leibniz rule, and I mean, and another rule that you can also easily check if you take x minus, I mean, these are all the things that you know from high school, but uh, anyway, so if you take the derivative of this, then it follows from the definition that again the usual rule applies, namely that this is. Uh, if you take the derivative of this, this is x minus a to the r. So is r times x minus a to the r minus 1 times g. So you take the derivative. So this is the derivative of, of this, and then times g plus uh, the derivative of the other side. And so <clears throat> you see that this part is divisible by x minus 1, x minus a to the r. And this one is precisely divisible by x minus a to the r minus 1. So you find that the whole sum, the highest power of x minus a, which divides it, is r minus 1. Because if I put in this part, if I divide this by, I can divide this by x minus a to the r minus 1. So I get r times g. And if I apply this to, uh, to a, I get something non-zero. And here I get x minus a times g, mi g prime. If I apply this to a, I get 0. So this is how I get it. And so we see that we get that r is bigger then 1 if and only if uh, if f prime has a 0. Okay. 
Okay. So <coughs> now we want to. Uh, so this is all a little bit kind of obvious. I mean, you uh, you know that uh, this is the case. Now we want to come to some consequences which are a little bit. Uh, I mean, if one doesn't now applies this in the context of our field extension, we find that uh, you know something slightly non-obvious happens. I mean, it you know if we are <coughs> so that it almost looks important. You know that. It seems pretty clear that normally a field extension must be separable, because this one can see from the following theorem. Let f in Kx be irreducible. Then f has no multiple roots. in its splitting field if and only if if I take the derivative of f this is not the zero polynomial so it's not equal to zero in the zero polynomial so that's a rather big step here we said a multiple root is if you have a zero of f and the derivative now we say in this situation where we start with an irreducible polynomial and we ask about the multiple roots in the splitting field this can only happen if the derivative is the zero polynomial now in <coughs> so <coughs> maybe i should say now normally you would think you know, if you are working over the real numbers, if you take the derivative of a polynomial, it can only be zero if the polynomial is a constant. But uh, this is not quite clear true here, because if the characteristic of the polynomial is not zero, it can happen. Also, a polynomial of positive degree, that's the derivative, is zero. But on the other hand, if the characteristic is zero, it cannot happen. So this theorem will immediately apply that every field of characteristic zero is perfect. So that in particular, this condition of uh, uh, separability is not usually such a strong one. So let's prove it. It's not so difficult. So we take a splitting field. Of f. Clearly. Clearly, if, uh, if our derivative is equal to zero, so if f prime is the zero polynomial, then all roots, then by what we have seen here, all roots of f in L are multiple roots. And you know, as this, we have a polynomial which is irreducible, in particular of positive, positive degree. It has some roots in its splitting field, and so it has some multiple roots. So this is the trivial direction. So this is obvious because every root will be a multiple root if f is equal to zero. F prime is equal to zero. No, f is identically so equal to zero. Derivative. What? Hmm? Is different from zero or is no. Zero? It's equal to zero, but zero as a polynomial. Not that f prime of a is equal to zero, but the derivative is the zero polynomial. No? So it has multiple roots, roots if and only if the derivative is the zero polynomial. Now, <coughs> What? Ah, uh, 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 oh, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Okay. I, I didn't look what I had written. Obviously, you are right. So, which way around do I want to formulate it? Yes. 
Yeah. So in fact, I mean, you know, I was sure of what I meant, but I wrote precisely the opposite. Okay. So obviously, this is if and only if it is not identically equal to zero. Okay. So sorry. You know, obviously the rest, the other, the other way around would be nonsense. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So it, or equivalently, it has multiple roots if and only if this is identically equal to zero. So one of the two has to be negated. Okay. So now let's uh, do the non-trivial direction. So assume we have a multiple root. So that means we have that f of a is equal to f of a, f prime of a is equal to zero. But um, that means no f is irreducible, and um, so up to multiplying by a non-zero constant, it means that f is the minimal polynomial of a. So as f is irreducible, up to multiplying, yes? What? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So basically, you know, all the signs were the other round. But anyway, what? No, but in theorem now, I thought hopefully did it. It has no multiple roots if and only f prime is not identically zero. I think now it's correct. Yeah. yeah. But obviously, I could have said it has it has multiple roots if and only if that would have been here. I have twice said no. <laughs> Maybe that uh, that was complicated, too complicated for me, and so uh, <clears throat> so so f is irreducible up to multiplying, and so it follows that up to multiplying by a constant by a constant in k, so to alpha in k, we have that f is the minimal polynomial. of A over K. Okay. And F prime, and the minimal polynomial is the, you know, it means it's that this F generates the ideal of all polynomials which vanish at A. So it means that F prime also is this, is this in this ideal. So thus, F prime is in the ideal generated by F. That means F divides f prime. But you know, this now is uh, rather unlikely because uh, if f prime is not zero, it follows that the degree of f prime is smaller than the degree of f just by the definition that I wiped out of the derivative. You know, you can see that the, 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 the degree of the derivative is one less than the degree of f. So if f prime is not identically zero, then f prime, the degree of f prime, is smaller than the degree of f. But we know that uh, when we multiply two polynomials, the degree of the product is the sum. So this is impossible. No? The degree of, if, I, if something is divisible by f, then its degree must be at least bigger or equal to f. So this is a contradiction. So the only way out is that f prime is equal to 0. OK, so it's not particularly difficult. And so as I said, it follows as a corollary 
every field k of characteristic 0 is perfect. And this is because, as I said, that um, So if the characteristic, no, this is because if the characteristic of k is uh, equal to 0, then uh, if f is a polynomial in kx, which is not constant, uh, then f prime is not equal to 0 just from the definition. You know, you have, uh, um, you know, if, you, if f is equal to sum a i x to the i, and we can assume, so a i is in k, and we can assume that a n is different from 0 by uh, only taking the, then uh, f prime is equal to sum i equal 0, i equal 1 to n, i times a i x to the i minus 1. And now the, the leading term is n times a n. No, because uh, in, uh, if uh, <coughs> you can easily see if the characteristic not 0, then for any element in k, the, you know, once you the statement for 1, that n times 1 is equal to 0, is, a, is if n times 1 is never equal to 0, then n times a is never equal to 0 for a non-zero element in k. Maybe I should have proven that. Anyway, so, <coughs> so thus f prime is not 0. So on the other hand, for instance, if you take the polynomial x to the p minus uh, whatever, uh, x to p squared minus x to the p. So if I take the derivative of this thing, then f, in fp, this will be 0. So, so, in, so if I view this as a polynomial as of fp of x, then uh, the derivative of this, or maybe whatever, and two uh, p. So this is the element in F p, which is p times 2p times 1, but p times 1 is equal to 0. So this is 0 plus 0 is equal to 0. So it certainly can happen in characteristic p that the derivative of a polynomial is 0, even if the polynomial is not constant. OK. So this is, um, <clears throat> and so we see, I mean, something which, is, uh, which we will not prove uh, which is also true, is that, however, also every finite field is perfect. And we have just seen that this, this criterion somehow obviously fails, but we, one can prove that also every finite field is perfect. It's not in the notes. Um, but here we only prove that every field of characteristic 0 is perfect. But there are some fields of characteristic P, P which are not finite, which will not be perfect. But we will not talk about that. OK, so now we want to prove a real theorem. So we have, in some sense, one of the main reasons why we have introduced these separable extensions is that we can prove the following theorem, which uh, <coughs> is the theorem of the primitive element. So it says that if we have a finite separable field extension, then it's a simple algebraic extension. So remember that in the beginning, 
we studied simple algebraic extensions, which are extensions by just adding one algebraic element, and we had been able to completely describe them. And um, <coughs> so now uh, we find that uh, this description holds in some sense, for instance, in characteristic uh, uh, zero for all field extensions because if you have a fi for all finite field extensions if you, because if you have a finite several field extension it is a simple algebraic extension so if we have a field extension which is obtained by adding a finite number of algebraic elements then we can just find one element so that the field extension is given by adding just this one element obviously not necessarily one of the elements we added but some combination of them and so I will try to prove that so this is a theorem of the primitive element. So the statement is, so let L over K be a finite separable extension. So for instance, in characteristic zero, it would be just a finite extension, finite field extension. Then it is a simple extension. So that means there exists an element A in L such that L can be obtained by K by just adding this one element A. So we might have constructed L by adding many elements to K, but we can find one which is sufficiently uh, uh, complicated to give us the whole of L if we add it. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's see. Uh, so this is, uh, we want to prove that. So we will make a simplifying assumption which is not necessary but which simplifies the proof. So I don't prove it quite in this generality. So for simplicity, we assume that k is infinite. So this um, the statement proves also if k is a finite field. But for one thing, it's anyway somewhat special case. And secondly, the proof that I give will not work for a finite field. One needs a different proof. Okay, this proof is it's simpler for infinite fields. So, for instance, if k is something like q, then the proof will be okay. So, for instance, if uh, uh, the characteristic of k is equal to zero then it's clear that k is infinite. And if the characteristic is uh, p, then we still want it to be infinite. So, so, you know, anyway, as we will see, the proof is somewhat difficult, a little bit uh, with trick. So let's see how we do it. So we have that. So we start. So we know that L over K is a finite extension. So it follows it's a finite algebraic extension because if it's finite, it must be algebraic. So we have that um, uh, we know that we can write L equal to k, we join some elements a1 to a n with a i and l. Now we know that the finite extensions are the finitely generated algebraic extensions. So if we have a finite extension, we can find finitely many elements so that if we join them to k, we get l. And we will have to show that we can somehow change these elements so that in the end we only need one.
we do this, so, so we want to uh, to <coughs> uh, let me see. Anyway, so we will we will prove this by we will do our proof by induction on n. So we want to prove that we can do it with one element. We want to prove this by induction on n. So proof by induction on n. So we have L which is equal to k a1 to a n. So by induction on the number of generators, we have that, so by, by the inductions, so if n is equal to 1, we are done. We have nothing to prove. So by induction, we have uh, k a1 to a n minus 1 is equal to k of a for some element a. in k a1 to a n minus 1. No? We know if we, the induction hypothesis, which we can use here, is that if we have n minus 1, if we join n minus 1 elements, we can do this by just adjoining 1. So thus, L, which is k a1 to a n, is k a comma a n. So, which means that by using induction, we can assume that the number n that we have here is equal to 2. So, we can, you know, can uh, reduce to the case that we join just two elements. Thus, we can assume L is equal to, say, I'm, say k a b, and to show There exists an element C in K A B such that this element K that K A B is equal to K of C. Okay. So using induction we have reduced to the case that we have only two, we joined only two elements. And actually what we will show, we will show something slightly stronger, which will, for instance, not hold in the case of finite fields. So this is where the proof is different. Um, so, so in fact, we can choose uh, C equal to A plus Z times B for suitable element z in k. So that means we can write, um, we can find a, a linear combination of these two with coefficients in k such that this thing is generated by this linear combination alone. And now we have to somehow find, uh, you know, this linear combination. And that's a bit... Um, So now we go to some field where, ah, did I miss? So let first um, let uh, F be the minimal polynomial, polynomial of A over K and G be the minimal polynomial of B over K. And now we choose ourselves a field where both F and G split over linear factors, split into linear factors. We choose ourselves a field extension of KC where both F and G 
are a product of linear factors. So we can, for instance, first take the splitting field of F over K of C, not K of, uh, not K of C, we don't have C yet, of, over K of A. So let me write it a bit better. So, so let F over L be a field extension such that um, both F and G. So L is this KAB after all, so that both F and G split over into linear factors. over um, F. So as I said, we can do this by taking first the splitting field of F over L, and then, so this would be some field F prime, and then we take the splitting field of G over F prime, and this is our F. The, over this field, both uh, F and G will split into linear factors. So now, <laughs> We want to write, so we write down the roots, so the zeros of f and g into over this, over this field f, large f. So let, so x1 until xn be the roots of, uh, say, the polynomial f over the field large f. And uh, one of the roots is uh, is this a? We take the first one to be a. Okay, and we also take the roots of uh, of g over the field large f. Call them y one to y m, and the first one we take b. We know that it splits into linear factors. One of the zeros of it is B, so we can take this to be this one. Okay. So we have all these roots. And now, now is the place where we use that our field extension is separable. The fact that the field extension is separable means that as f and g were minimal polynomials. They were irreducible to begin with, and they have a, a zero here. Uh, so it means all their zeros are different. So the, the ai, so x, a is different from all the xi, and b is different from all the yi, except for uh, one and one here. So as... Um, L over K is a separable extension. Uh, we find that uh, all the roots, uh, so find the XI are pairwise distinct. So I, I count, so I should say, I take the roots here, I count them with multiplicity. No? So if I, if, if, uh, a, if I would have a multiple root, I write it four times. No? If, uh, if A is a root of order four, then, so it means, what I really mean that I can write, so I, I maybe haven't, so, so with multiplicity. Uh, multiplicity. So maybe I will, you know, as it doesn't matter so much, I will just write it one more, so more carefully. So that means that f is equal to x minus x1 times times x minus xn. So that means that it's the roots, no? And g is equal to x minus y1 times x minus yn. And uh, then the statement is 
that if I write it like this, then all the xi are distinct among each other because that means you have known multiple roots and all the yi are distinct, ym. So all, so as, as L over K is uh, separable, uh, we have that uh, so all the xi are pairwise distinct. And all the yi are pairwise distinct. Okay. Because, uh, as I said, f was an irreducible polynomial over kx, and so the roots over the splitting field are all simple. Because we have several extensions. So now, until now, we don't seem to have done very much. And now I, now I want to find this z. OK? Uh, we'll do this. As follows, we use that they are all distinct. So, so we can write, so let me first write it down. So thus, uh, for E from, first I write down, then we check it, 1 to N, and uh, J from 2 to M, we have that Zij equal to xi minus a divided by b minus yj is the unique element <coughs> um, of our field f such that um, I write like this, a plus zij times b is equal to xi plus zij times yj. Now this looks a bit difficult to digest first, but in some sense it is completely obvious. If you look at this formula, so if I, I want to solve this, so a plus zij B equal to this. So so I can bring something on the other side. So this is equal if and only if A, maybe I can write X. So I put this to the other side. So Xi minus A, if I subtract the A, is equal to zij uh, times b minus zij times yj. No? Just have this, this equation. I bring things on the other side. So this statement is equivalent to that, that you, uh, I think, also, so which means that zij times b minus yj, so is equivalent to this being equal to xi minus a. So we know that all the roots of, uh, you know, all these yj's are distinct from each other y2, uh, y1 is equal to b. So all the yj with j bigger than 1, this difference is not equal to 0. So I can divide by it. So this is equivalent So this is equivalent because we know that b uh, minus yj is not 0 for 
g different from 2. And we have assumed there that g is, diff is different from 1. Um, this is equivalent to zij, as I said, is equal to xi minus a divided by b minus yj. Okay, so I've now just checked the statement which I had made. Okay. This, this element zig is the unique element of f which, uh, such that this equation is satisfied. You know, I've given you a proof. So, <clears throat> now, and now we use this assumption that our field k is supposed to be infinite. So, <clears throat> We have for all pairs i and j, we have one such element zij in f. So altogether, these are at most uh, uh, m minus 1 times n elements. So our field k has, more, uh, has infinitely many elements. So it certainly has an element which is not one of these. So let z in k be different from all the Zij. So for, you know, as I said, I from 1 to n, J from 2 to n. So we can just find an element as in this is possible as k is infinite. And now the claim is, so now we put, so thus, if we take uh, A plus Z times B, then this is different from XI plus ZYJ for all I from 1 to N and all J from 2 to M. No? This is how we have chosen it. I mean, this. So now the claim is that this is enough to make sure that if I put C equal to A plus Z times B, that this will be uh, equal, will generate the same field extension. So let C be equal to A plus Z times p, and the claim is that kc is equal to k of ab, which was our field f. Now, obviously, this inclusion, kc is in contained in kab, is clear because c is an element in kab. After all, it's just a linear combination of A and B. So the, what we have to prove is the other inclusion. And so for that, it is enough to show that both A and B are contained in KC. So we will now want to show that B is contained in KC. Then for A, it's trivial by the formula. So I want to see, show B is an element in KC. With, we, I mean, we do this again with trick. So we write down some crazy polynomial. We take polynomial H with coefficients in KC. So let uh, be defined by So we put h of x equal to f of c minus z times x. So you replace, you know, you, you have a polynomial, some a, a i x to the i, and you replace the x by this, so you get some a i this thing to the i. And you can see that this will be a polynomial with coefficients 
in Kc. And now, <coughs> uh, what can we see? So one thing that we find, what is the value of h at b? Well, we just put it. This is f of c minus z times b. Now, <coughs> uh, uh, c was this one. So if I uh, subtract z times b from it, I get a. And f was the minimal polynomial of a. This is equal to 0. So we find that b is a 0 of h. So thus, it follows. So x minus b is a, div is a divisor of h. And we want to use this fact that it's a divisor to show that H, that this B actually is in KC. So we know, obviously we also know that X minus B is a divisor of uh, G, no? because B was G. Uh, G was the minimal polynomial of B, so uh, B is a zero of it. So we find that this is a common divisor. We want to show that X minus B is a, a greatest common divisor. Of um, G and um, h, so say an f of x. So whatever field they both split. <coughs> and when we have done this, we will see that this uh, will prove it. And this is actually quite simple, because g splits over f into linear factors. So if you have a, a greatest common divisor, it must be a product of these linear factors up to multiplying by a constant. So a divisor of g is so up to multiplying by constant um, a product of these linear factors of some of these linear factors remember that these linear factors were x minus yi from i from 1 to m. So the greatest common divisor must be a product of some of these. So, <clears throat> but uh, if, uh, um, but you know, such a thing can only be a factor of h if uh, these yi's are zeros of h. Where am I? So, so, but uh, x minus yi, maybe I, I denoted them by j, the index, just to keep it as before, is a 0 of uh, h if and only if uh, h of yj 
is equal to 0. No? So, but what is h of yj? I mean, you have, after all, you know, defined h in this way. So, and now I'm, anyway, I wiped out the definition of the z, but I expect you. Um, so, h of yj, by our definition, is equal to f uh, of uh, c minus z. And um, uh, we had precisely defined uh, C, the Z, in such a way that, so which uh, means that maybe I write it out as F of uh, A plus Z. Uh, B minus Z times Yj, is that correct? So, and we had defined our Z precise in such a way that this can never be equal to a zero of F. So, we had, by definition, of Z, we have that this thing, A plus ZB minus Z times Yj, is different from xi for all zeros xi of f in the field f. So that means this is not zero. Okay? So this will never be zero. So that means none of these factors divides uh, our h. The only factor, the only uh, kind of factor of uh, G, which also divides uh, H, is this one, X minus B. And this means it is the greatest common divisor. Is a monic, I mean, it's monic, as you can see, greatest common divisor. of um, H and G. <clears throat> now, you have to see, <clears throat> now, if you uh, remember, we had this statement. If we have, uh, uh, after doing the uh, Euclidean algorithm, as a consequence of this Euclidean algorithm, I proved that if you have, a, you know, have two polynomials with coefficients in a field, and you take their greatest common divisor, their monic greatest common divisor, with coefficients in a bigger field, then, the, then, in fact, the polynomial will lie in the smaller field. So, here in this case, we have, so, as a, a H, <coughs> um, <coughs> and G, are both uh, in Kc of x. No, because in fact, g after all is a polynomial with coefficients in k. So it's even in k of x. It follows that their greatest common divisor, if we require to be monic, has coefficients also in Kc of x. is in Kc 
of x if you if we apply this to be monic. So it means that x minus b is a polynomial in Kc of x. And now, obviously, that's, uh, that means just that b is an element in Kc. And then, obviously, um, we are done because c is equal to a plus zb. So c is equal to a plus zb. So in other words, a is equal to, <coughs> now this is very difficult, zb minus c. So this is an element in k. This we now know is an element in kc. And this is also an element in kc. So it follows the whole thing is an element in kc. So we find both a and b lie in kc. So uh, uh, thus kab is contained in kc. So that's, <coughs> anyway, that proves it. The, yeah, it's a bit difficult to understand what somehow the idea of the proof is. I mean, it's a, somehow, you know, also if somebody would ask you to prove this theorem, <laughs> you would find that rather difficult to achieve, and so would I. Um, so <clears throat> somehow, anyway, the, the trick is maybe the story that you, you want to, uh, uh, to see that this x minus b is a greatest common divisor of uh, these two polynomials, and um, this will then, once you have that, by uh, some rather trivial fact, it follows that B is in KC. And uh, in order to find that this is the greatest common divisor, you have to somehow achieve that, uh, you know, you know you, it must, you want to make it the greatest common divisor of two polynomials in KC. You have to make this uh, kind of strange trick of kind of cooking up this H in order to make the greatest common divisor. And uh, <clears throat> then you want to, to choose an element here with the property that, you have, that they have precisely one zero together, namely B. And for this, you have to choose this Z appropriately in this way. So it's a, you know, it's a several tricks and one, you know, it's not... Um, not a kind of natural proof. You, you are given the problem. There's an obvious thing you want to do, and you do it. It's just, uh, you know, once uh, uh, somebody has done it, one can understand it, but one still doesn't quite understand why one would think about it this way. Anyway, it's true, and we have proven it. OK, ah, the time is up. So I now wanted to start something else, but then I won't. Okay, so um, so that was as much as I wanted to say now about separable extensions. So next time we will first briefly talk about finite fields. So we'll classify all finite fields up to isomorphism. And uh, then we will go on with a study of uh, studying field extensions. We'll uh, really go into Galois theory. We'll introduce the Galois groups and uh, then kind of slowly come to try uh, to start to the proof of the main theorem of Galois theory. Okay.